luck is not a random occurrence. Like luck is when hard work meets opportunity. And I've always carried that with me because you can meet so many opportunities in your life, but if you haven't put in work, whether it's on yourself, on projects, on skills, to be ready to say yes to the opportunity and show up for the opportunity, you're not gonna have these moments. And that's what I've loved about jumping into the uh, entrepreneur world of even just travel nurses and healthcare professionals like yourselves who have Ooh, such I fun. gotta go. Hey. I've been working, told them please don't hit my phone. No. I'm in my zone, bro, just leave me alone. Hey. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. I swear I paid all my fees. I was starving for this game, now my fan they can't eat. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Couple Nurses Podcast with your host, Matt, and myself, Peter. For those that don't know, make sure you check us out on YouTube. We have all our videos on YouTube. We have all our vlogs on YouTube. We also have some cool nurse uh, debriefings that we that we showcase after we do our shifts. Don't forget to visit couplenurses.com. We keep all our show notes there. Also some cool nursing blogs. If you need any travel nursing information or just nursing information in general, we have all of it there. Also some health and wellness information on that website too. Also, we have another site called wearefrontlinewarriors.com. And that is more of a health, mental, mental health, wellness, um, mindfulness kind of a site. So you can check out some more blogs on there. And for those of you that also don't know is we are releasing something called Pronto here shortly. If you're more interested on what's it about, check out prontohealth.com. We have a landing page right there. You can sign up and just get some updates of where we're at with that. It's something geared towards the healthcare industry, helping you land your next career move, your career job, help you with your travel contract, help you find a staffing position, just really whatever you need in the, in the healthcare setting, even progressing with your with education. It should be all on there and slowly getting released. So make sure you guys check up on us as well. Matt, what's up? What's up? What's up? In this episode, we'd like to introduce our guests, Kat Rogers and Jonathan Pierre, both from Med Travel Hub. They have both traveled for over four years and are passionate about finding community in the healthcare industry. We This is a jam-packed episode. We talk about international travel, travel nursing, and just the full experience of nursing, what it means to be a nurse. A lot of value. Get ready for this one. It's great. Hey, John. Hey, Kat. Welcome to the show. Can you, get, can you guys give us a little intro about yourselves and your experience as a nurse? Absolutely. Kat, feel free to start. Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Kat. I'm an ER travel nurse. Um, I started nursing in Virginia um, at a level one trauma out there, did a nurse residency program and um, really got a feel for the ropes of things and then uh, went and did travel nursing, which was always my goal. Um, we had a travel nurse come speak to us our senior year of uh, college and he just seemed really cool and like he was living the dream in New York City and that really inspired me. So I put in my respectful two years of experience. Then I went out and um, very quickly got sucked in by California <laughs> with uh, solid ratios and a guaranteed lunch break. So been here about two, two and a half years, just bouncing around uh, from South to North Carolina, uh, California for a little bit. How about you, Jonathan? Uh, so what's up everyone? My name is Jonathan, AKA Nurse John. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, that's where I got my nursing career started and also put in my respectful two years and bounced because uh, New York is crazy when it comes to nursing. Uh, I came to California, I do step down and uh, I spent like the next five years just bouncing up and down the coast. You know, So I started in San Francisco, I uh, lived in San Diego, worked in LA, Oakland, San Jose. I was essentially dating California to see if I you know, would want to stay here. But essentially it was never really a plan to stay just five years later, I'm still here. So now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, settling down a bit in, in Oakland or in, in the area. Uh, and yeah, I've been, been nursing here ever yeah, since. That's, that's what's crazy about California, because uh, Matt and I, our first contract, we talked about it before we started the show, was actually in Oakland. And like, once you go to California, it like almost sucks you in. Like you're, you're trying to figure out, hey, am I gonna like California? Especially for you, it's such a big shift from the East Coast to the West Coast. Man, and I are from, the, are from the Midwest, so we're like halfway there that you could say. And like, I'm sure you could attest to this, like the people in New York are a little bit different than people in, in California, right? Yeah. So how did you, yeah, so what, what did you like, what did you notice like the biggest difference about New, York, New Yorkers and like Californians, you could say? Ha, that's an easy one. Um, New Yorkers are crazy, let me just tell you. 
but those are my people, right? It's the kind of kind of crazy I'm comfortable with. But um, the first thing that I noticed was um, how no shade to anybody from the West Coast of California, but um, they're they're less confrontational, a little more passive aggressive, uh, a little less assertive, right? And 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 I understand partly reasons for that when you consider environments. I think about what the New York environment is. Millions of people, intense cold, intense heat, you're cramped together in trains, right? Intense competition for everything. It, it like chisels a personality out of you because you have to thrive if you want to thrive or compete in this market. It just makes you a certain way. Whereas if you're from California, man, and it's chill and the sun is out, it's going to foster a different type of personality so I, I noticed that immediately right it's, it's crazy because like i've been to new york i didn't do travel nursing in new york but i visited there and i got to know some of the people there i have family there and like new york is like straight business very assertive straight to the point and they like everything to be on a, on a timeline where in california you said it's more lax like i have the rest of the day to do this i'll take my time but it's, it's interesting to look at how things get done either way even if you have somebody that's like very punctual on time minute by minute versus someone that's like more lax because nursing still works there, even though you have two different types of, of nurse personalities, you could say. And I always find that so intriguing. Yeah, it's kind of funny. We have all something in common where we all wanted to travel to California to experience ratios and having a one-hour lunch. In our case, sometimes when we did a contract. So why do you guys think that travel nursing became so popular or maybe just California in that case? Well, I think California has always been a hot spot because, you know, they've had their unions in place probably since I think the 80s or 90s now. And those unions brought with them the ratios and the lunches. So it's just attractive. And then, I mean, it's the West Coast. It's got sunshine. It's got Disney. It's got L.A., you know, <laughs> it's got a little bit of all the things that people on the East Coast dream of seeing. So that's, uh, you know, a huge draw. And as, as far as travel nursing, um, you know, I've been a nurse almost six years now. And I remember when I was in, in school, it was just starting to get big. Like if you were in it before then you were kind of like the cool kid who knew about it before it was hip. And then, um, I mean, especially now the pandemic just blew it up because it's, you know, the prices just started to outweigh everything else and just make all those people who are hesitant about the travel piece of it and leaving home, you know, once it reaches a certain price point, I think everyone was just ready to, to jump in and, you know, again with the pandemic just like you never know what the next day is going to hold so you know screw it like i gotta go see the world and i gotta go right. try something new okay what's the biggest change that you've seen in the er like in california versus other states besides is it the, is it the ratios or is it something else between like east coast yeah, and west yeah. coast nursing oh uh yeah the ratios for sure make a big difference um and then on the east coast i would say it's just um the, the structure is a little bit different, like uh, experience is valued more. Um, that's the, my only beef sometimes with um, the ERs is, you know, on the East Coast, it's whoever has the most experience is going to be leading the team and be charge nurses. And um, California really values your, like, longevity with the company. So you can have someone who's only been a nurse two or three years, but they're actually, like, the most senior person there. And I think sometimes that messes up the dynamic um, of how nurses function in the ER. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I think – there's a lot more security <laughs> presence in the uh, California ERs, which we definitely appreciate, depending on the populations. Um, and then beyond that, it's all it's all pretty similar. And how long have you guys travel nursed? Like how many contracts or years? Oh, um, I'm probably going on contract eleven or twelve, and uh, like four years. Then, yeah. Yeah, it's been. This is I don't know how many contracts, but it's been about year five. And I think, you know, the most I've taken off in between the contract is maybe like two and a half months. So, and what, three months was the average contract before they started doing shorter, short-term contracts since COVID. So, yeah. Um, so, at least, you know, three contracts a year for the last five years. So, with all your experience, have you guys noticed like some commonalities in hospitals or some struggles that nurses are facing amongst every facility you guys have worked? Like, is there like a a flow of events or problems that you guys see in hospitals that we could all change in the future, kind of collaborate on? That's a very interesting question. I'll say this, you know, nursing is nursing, right? It's, it's, it's science. It's not rocket science. It's, it's pretty much just evidence-based things. And if you work at an institution that really goes evidence-based, you know, how you do things are, are pretty much standardized, right? For the most part. What I would say about you know hospital differences is is culture, 
And I think um, one of the best things that happened to me was in, in leaving New York at the hospitals I, I worked for. And my very first job was at UCSF. You can't get it. I mean, that's a tier one hospital. It's like a top three, top five hospital in the country. And I had to, I got a chance to work at two of those, UCSF and UCLA. And then stepping into where I came from and then where I got, I understood what it what it meant to work for, you know, like a tier one organization, an organization that really prides itself on culture and what that means, right? Uh, an organization that works on um, uh, thriving on like the pursuit of excellence and how that permeates in 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 all of your interactions. And it really comes from the top. When they say that, well, oh, culture started at the top, it's a real thing. It's like the people who, who are at the top said, this is what we want this us to be about. This is our mission. This is, this is our brand. This is our identity. And the people within that organization follow suit. And it's, it's a real thing. And, you know, that would be something to kind of bring to other hospitals because that that carries with it, you know, a positive mindset. It, ca it comes with this, like, people who are, um, you know, who are driven. It's like, they they encourage you, like, oh, you want to, you know, take time to get your master's or what kind of committee do you want to be on, right? They want to invest in you because if you're the best that you can be, you're going to make their brand stronger and then they want to keep you. So, you know, that's that's something that you can try and bring to different hospitals. But it really does depend on on who's leading that institution, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, people know? are very valuable, except like the managers, the leaders, they have to find that value in, in that person and use it for what they're what they're valued at. And that's a lot of things, or that's one reason I feel like people do travel nursing. One reason why they leave their staff unit is because they don't feel valued. They just feel like they're just there and they're replaceable at any time. They can come and go because nobody really, really cares about anything more than them coming in and doing their 12 hours. So if like you're going to pay me at average and you're going to just worry about me clocking and clocking out and not really care about anything else, then, you know, there's there's really no reason for, for me to stay at a staff job or a unit like that. If you're not going to help me progress or you're not going to care about my, my progression, if you don't care about my career goals, there's no re there's really no reason for anybody staying staff. I'm actually do travel and visit different places and, and enjoy things outside of this, you know, unit where I'm just like doing a 12 to 12 just just to, you know, go go by and move on with my day. Yeah, like it's a big I, thing. I was going to say, and this is why, like, we're what almost a year or two into the pandemic and hospitals are having a hard time with retention of staff nurses. You bring up a very good point. It's culture. There's culture and we're just not b being treated and valued properly. Mm -hmm. So why should I stay? Right. And nurses are four million strong. There's four million of us in the U.S. And like people are management is still trying to figure out, hey, how can we keep staff? How can we, you know, make things better on the unit? Well, like no one's asking nurses. It's like managers asking their superiors and then the superiors asking, you know, whoever, whoever, whoever else is in, a, in like their position laterally. They're no one's really asking nurses, hey, what do you guys need? What do you guys want? And during the pandemic, you know, they give us food. And that's pretty much about it, you know, and, <laughs> and it's like it's, it's wild. And we and we settled for it and we were OK with it because it was better than getting nothing, you know, and it's crazy to think about that. Yeah, and I think it's an yeah, and I think it's an intersection of two problems really, because you know they had predicted that around uh, you know twenty twenty five to twenty thirty was going to be another nursing shortage actually, and not because of volume like you were saying, but actually because of education. There's no educators left out there at the universities, and they're having to limit nursing class sizes. So you you come up shorter with nurses. So even though we are forming strong, like it'll be coming down, but yet we're also one of the highest predicted growth uh, spe like. Um, career paths expected all the way through 2026 than mm. any other industry. So it's like our need is increasing, our volume is decreasing, and yet these uh, hospitals still don't place the appropriate value on us. So while nursing has long been a profession that wasn't ever about money, I mean, most nurses I know, like, they care. Like, that's why you get into it, right? Like, you care about people. You want to make their life better. You want to provide value to them. And that was what drew people to this profession. But now um, it's kind of a result of being so undervalued for so long. They're like, you know, forget it. Like, I'm going to make it about the money then. And that's something that travel mm -hmm. offers because it doesn't give you like the security and the, you know, career advancement and things that were typically associated with a staff job, which is why you would take a staff job. But now that that's not even being like valued, it's like, well, then forget it. I'm just going to you know, get the money to make me feel like this is worth it for me because all the rest went to the wayside. So I think that's a huge issue we're facing, you know, especially in ERs. Um, you know, I've noticed the understaffing is insane. 
Um, and then the conditions become so bad from that that any nurses that they have managed to retain are like, no, I'm out. Like, you're this is terrible. So it was everyone's leaving, everybody's new, and it's just huge turnover. And so it, it's really just a question of how hospitals are going to finally maybe take a step um, towards correcting that longstanding problem that was just kind of you know brought to the forefront and highlighted by COVID. Yeah, it's it's crazy because I was just. I was just thinking about this a couple days ago because Matt and I got floated to a different hospital. So we work in North Austin. We got floated uh, to a different hospital uh, south of, of Austin. And like I felt valued on that shift more than I felt valued working a staff job because I feel like as travel nurses, you come into units that are short staffed and the value you provide is just you being there and helping them out. Yeah, they're thankful. Right? They're thankful that, that you're there. And I've, I feel more valued as a traveler than I have ever felt at my staff job. Because everybody's glad that I'm there. I'm coming to work as a traveler because because they need us. Like, yeah, I'm getting paid more money than the, the staff is. And I also feel a lot more valued than some of the staff does, unfortunately. kind of sounds kind of shitty, but, you know, we're, we're filling a, a gap and a need and everyone values us. Because if man, I didn't come to work, guess what? That's four patients that don't have nurses. And then they got to get tripled or they got to cover. So I feel very valued as a traveler and that makes my life more fulfilling. So how do you guys, how do you guys feel being travelers? Because I know some nurses say that, oh, staff doesn't like travelers, but I haven't met any staff that's particularly rude to us uh, as travelers. I mean, occasionally, maybe it's just the ear because we can be a little bit of assholes sometimes. <laughs> but <laughs> there is this little like litmus test sometimes at bigger hospitals where they like throw a really crappy assignment your way, kind of they're like, see if you can pull your weight beyond that. I, I wouldn't say I, I've seen any like terrible behavior. And if anything, like you said, a lot of them just like to, um, you know, they're not only happy you're there, like you said, providing that need, but also they just think you're fun people. Like, Oh my gosh, where have you traveled? And like, where are you from? I'm like, tell me more. Like they just like to pick your brain and that's fun for them. Cause it's not someone they see on the daily. So I, I've had really positive experiences with it. I don't know if I've just been lucky, but um, yeah, that's for me at least. You're also in California, <laughs> where it's a lot more safer. Um, I've also had positive experiences, but um, you know, I, I do talk to a lot of travelers that haven't had positive experiences or have just had a few negative ones. But like, they're definitely out there. Um, you know, the sink or swim things. I mean, that's that that can be a real thing. Um, when you talk about like culture, there's certain hospitals that historically they just they will dump on you. And it's just you're gonna go there. Other travelers know it. Like it's just it's just a thing. Uh, but in general, I f I feel like travelers like the Navy SEALs of nurses, right? Like these special ops, specialized individuals that kind of come in and get the job done. You know, they're kind of flashy. Everybody, oh, we travel, we do all these things, and they're up, they're gone. And, you know, just disappear into the night or disappear into some other country and have a good time. <laughs> But I, I I like I really appreciate what um what traveling offers, right? It's 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 more than just a thing you do within your career. It's a lifestyle. And it definitely isn't for everyone. But for those of us who are about that life, it's it's an interesting life. I kind of see it too. I like the Navy SEAL um metaphor you used there. I never thought about that one, but I almost see like a freelancer, like you're almost like a mercenary. I definitely felt like that during the pandemic, you just kind of go out there and do your best. And, you know, you're you're with a unit or a team that's uh, providing excellent care. And then you just, just like you said, you just leave and go to another contract or job or whatever it is. Um, and also what's nice about travel nursing is you get to make money, pay off your debt, and then also have time to be an entrepreneur if you can. So I know you guys were trying to build a community and all that. So can you guys share some info about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In uh, in 2018, so that's one of the first things I noticed. Um, you know, you leave home, you leave where you're from, you leave your family and friends. Like that, in and of itself, isn't a big deal. But then, you know, traveling can be a very transient lifestyle. So you're here today, you meet all these people, and then they're gone, you're gone, and then you have to do it again. Upside is you can have people in Austin, you can have people in Virginia, you can have people all over the place that you're cool with that you've met along the way, mm -hmm. but they're not where you are. And if anything, I hope people learn from the pandemic is like how much people need people, people need community. So I recognized that very early on in uh, in 2018, where I came to San Francisco and I was always looking for other travelers to hang out with. And they were looking for me. We were all looking for each other. Um, so the very natural progression, I, I, I started a company 
that uh, didn't work, but it's entrepreneurship. That's how it goes. So that failed. But then, you know, I reiterated and, I, and then I came with uh, ultimately what became a travel hub. And in the struggles of trying to build that first company, it was very stressful and, you know, failure was annoying me. Spending the money and losing the money was annoying me. And then I forgot, well, this is the game. Relax, suck it up and get back on the horse and go ride. At the end of that year, I felt like I needed a vacation. I'm like, all right, I haven't been away since whatever year I went away. I did a backpacking trip. I need a trip. I always want to go to Thailand. I know a lot of people here. I should invite them to Thailand. I should create something and invite. And then I just it just rolled into this thing, which ultimately became Med Travel Hub, where I bring a community of healthcare professionals together to share experiences around the world. Um, and, and that's you know, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. Like I, I wanted a community and I needed a vacation. And I brought those two together. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I like that you brought the entre entrepreneurship uh, aspect of it because, like you said, you, you're an entrepreneur and you your first project was a, was a failure. You know, you lost some money. But that's like the, you can say, like the cost of entry. Like you could either A, pay money, go to school and learn that way. Or, you know, you could try doing stuff yourself, figure it out. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you lose the money, but you you you, you learn from it, right? So that's the learning process. That's like the cost of learning. You're always going to gonna trade something for something you know you trade your your finances for for knowledge and now you're you're building a whole new company and you're trying to grow the travel nursing community is it just for travel nurses or just nurses in general all healthcare professionals in general you know nurses travel nurses because i am a nurse it was low-hanging fruit you know it was the community that i was connected to on social media in real life so it was it was easy to kind of you know build with that but um you know it's open to all healthcare professionals really so I have a few, you know, like xraytechs.com and, and uh, one of my guys, he goes in like everything we do. Uh, he's a cath lab tech. Mm -hmm. um, but it was easy for me to access nurses because I am one. Um, but it's, it's open to all healthcare professionals. And then Kat, how did you get involved with this venture? Um, yeah, I'm actually a pretty recent add-on. Um, I met Jonathan at TravCon this year in September. And, well, hold on. Uh, don't, don't whitewash it. Cat ran up on me in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, but you ran up on me. Okay, all right. All right. So um, we were at a, a mutual friend's hangout, and um, I just through the grapevine heard that Jonathan had a travel company. And for years, I've been the the planner of trips among my friends, and I've been known for like insanely detailed itineraries, for better or for worse. So <laughs> I heard he had a travel company, and I've been looking to you know, do something that's not bedside nursing, uh, you know, switch up and, and get more in, involved in different avenues of life. And so I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna pitch myself. So I was like, Jonathan, can I, um, can I just pitch myself to you for a minute? <laughs> I was like, I'm really good at itineraries. You should hire me and um, we should see where this goes. So <laughs> from there, we've just kind of collaborated and I've really enjoyed um, jumping in uh, to the Med Travel Hub uh, fully. And um, it's a really exciting company because I, I mean, it just it fills such a need like he was saying it's 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 travel and i feel like everyone needs that break and that mental wellness check after the two years we've had and then it blends seamlessly with like creating a community i mean having traveled for almost four years i always say like i have all the 10 friends i need it's just none of them live in my city you know so what that ends up being is like once a year we try to plan a trip and that kind of is, you know, dovetails into exactly what Med Travel Hub offers is, you know, for those travelers who like we make so many friends along the way, but there's never really a easy point to meet back up again, or even for healthcare professionals who who maybe are even staff um, professionals, like they don't have a lot of time. But if you have a trip that's planned out for you, and you that takes that off your plate, you get your community, you get your mental health check. You get some travel and fun relaxation in there and it's just a win all around. I like how you guys mentioned community because doing my first contract in San Diego, you know how as a staff nurse, you guys get breakfast beers, you guys all chatty, everybody's friends. That's something that travel nursing does offer. You could, you know, you, know, you could jump into a, um, a unit and be friendly, but sometimes you feel that loneliness, that kind of pushback that I'm different, I'm not a staff job or a staff nurse. So de definitely a community is needed for travel nurses, especially if you're in different cities doing it alone. It's hard to bond with people sometimes, and especially with the state of, er you know, in the era that we are with the pandemic, you just don't go out of bar sometimes and socialize as much as we used to back in the day because mm. of the the norm, I would say. Mm. Yeah, that's the worst thing about it. Like you, you mentioned it yesterday, I'm not sure if you realized, but like, 
we've almost like the communication that, that has happened in the, in the hospital, like during a pandemic COVID where like family can come in, restricted visiting hours. I feel like that's almost how life is, is now too. Like you're not doing the same thing that, that you were doing pre-pandemic, yeah. you know, you're changing up, up your life. Like the same changes you see in a hospital, it's like you see on everyday living and, it, and, it's, and it's unfortunate and it sucks. And hopefully we could sometime return back to like the, to, to back then how it actually was. And do you guys just do once a year uh, trips or do you guys do like meetings every so often? It's just like, a, how does is, how is that work with you guys? Once a year, no, we're, we're trying to do many, many trips a quarter. Um, I, I started with that one trip to Thailand. It was, it was okay. a big group of about 20 something of us. Like the following year, I did Thailand again because it's such an, it's on everybody's bucket list. You can always get people to go to Thailand. And then I also included a trip to Spain and Morocco. The year after that, which was the year of the pandemic, 2020, we had four trips planned, one trip a quarter. So we actually got one of them off. We went to Colombia, which was incredible. Um, then there was you know, Tanzania, Zanzibar, Greece, Bali, and Vietnam, just one trip a quarter. Uh, obviously, the rest of them didn't happen. So it's interesting and almost serendipitous like how Kat and I got together because I didn't reset, right? The pause button was hit for sure. Nothing I can do about that. But it's almost like I, you know, I got squat up, as they say. Cat came along and we're like doubling down and, and planning more than what I had before. And it's exciting. And, and, I, and I love, you know, I'm a very like goal oriented person. I need a carrot. I need to know what I'm chasing all the time so I can just keep running. And so it's been great. We have a, a ton of trips that we're looking to do in 2022. And um, it, it's exciting if you want to add anything to that, Kat. I just um, wanted to take one second to give Kat her flowers. And we were talking about like how we met. And this is this is, you know, for you know, for your audience and your listeners, when you when you consider, you know, meeting people in general and anything that you want to build and do out there, providing value, right? Kat literally did run up on me at a party, <laughs> right? But it was it was immediately like this is like I have value and and this is what I can do for you, right? And we were just talking about service and serving others. And and one of the things she did immediately when when I spoke to her like the very next day, she's like, Well, let me show you a little bit about what I can do. Let me send an itinerary to you. She's like, you'll have that by like Thursday. I think it was a Monday. I had that within an hour. You know, so they like give myself some wiggle room, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the kind of person that that she was and is, and it's been incredible. But yeah, we we have a lot of trips that we're trying to do um, in 2022. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that moment uh, we met because I just for on, on the note of entrepreneurs, I I um, always had something that stuck in the back of my mind. Someone told me in high school, you know, and I feel like I've seen it a lot in our very comparative social media world of like you see people get fortunate in things and you think it just happens to them and oh they're so lucky you know and there's this concept that things just occur for these people and um i remember in high school one of my coaches had told me like luck is not a random occurrence like luck is when hard work meets opportunity and i've always carried that with me because you can meet so many opportunities in your life but if you haven't put in work whether it's on yourself on projects on skills to be ready to say yes to the opportunity and show up for the opportunity, you're not going to have these moments. And that's what I've loved about jumping into the uh, entrepreneur world of even just travel nurses and healthcare professionals like yourselves who have such fun uh, jobs and whole companies on the side um, and meeting you guys is just, you know, you'll find so much opportunity out there if you're just willing to have the hard work to back it up and to be able to say yes. And that's like what happened for us. Yeah. For, for you guys though, how important is is like international travel for you and, and and how much time do you kind of make space for you know within a year to actually go out there in the world and, and travel so at the moment it's zero but i would love to be more exposed to international traveling so that was going to be my next question is how do you even organize international travel because it's so much different than booking a ticket to miami florida and planning an uber and a hotel there and doing a couple of attractions versus trying to figure out another language. Yeah. Um, well, Kat is like the uh, itinerary specialist here. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like a, a, a mad scientist situation. I mean, there's a lot of Google tabs open, <laughs> a lot of coordination. 
Um, you know, I like to do my research. It's a combination of, you know, looking at other travelers and what their recommendations have been, a combination of, you know, a very personal experience. I have a lot of friends who travel and they're usually the ones who can give me insight to those great like hole in the walls. You're not going to find out on any Pinterest, Travelocity website at all. Um, and then just a lot of, um, you know, what, what do I think is fun? What do I think is of value? And um, when I create travel itineraries, I always want to make sure like it's activities that are unique to that location. I feel like um, my biggest beef is when people travel and they go do things that you could do at home. Like <laughs> you go to that beach town spot and you, and you sit on the beach and I'm like, okay, we live in California. It's like 20 minutes away. Like I don't, you know, so I like to pick things that are, you know, very culturally involved or relevant. And so you really get the experience of the country you're visiting. Um, and then coordination is just um, a lot of Googling. That's awesome because like the United States is, is a, like a giant country, but it's something different when you, when you leave the, the U.S. and you go to a different country. It's just the culture there, just the way they, they do things. It's like not something that you can watch on TV. Like you can watch a video of like, you know, the Galapagos, whatever the island is with like the turtles, Galapagos or whatever it's called. I don't even know. Man. Yeah, go something ahead. like that. You can watch videos on it. Yeah, but like actually going there is a whole different experience, you know, so that, that goes like with, with every country in the world because they have different dialect. They even though, you know, you could translate words, they say it in, a, in a different way. You know, it's, it's an amazing experience and it's being able to see it firsthand. It's almost like a miracle you know, to, to experience that like in the world. And I noticed you guys mentioned Bali and then that's on my bucket list. So I would love to go there. And then also Machu Picchu, I mm -hmm. think just hearing about the the mountain ranges, the hikes that you could do there, that's, that would definitely be amazing. Yeah, that, that trip is uh, its happening in April. Um, that's that's part of our bucket list series because, I mean, just that image at the top of Machu Picchu is so iconic and you see it, you know exactly what it is and, and a lot of people want to do it. So we definitely wanted to make sure we uh, were able to provide that experience. Right, so what are you, what country are you trying to hit in 2022? Woo, woo. <laughs> um, I mean, for the ones we've uh, already booked, uh, we're doing St. Patty's Day in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, we're doing Machu Picchu in March. Uh, we've got a big Mexico trip on the books for June. Uh, Portugal, Germany. What are the other ones? Yeah, um, so we, we have a, a calendar of a lot that we want to do. There's, um, uh, Breckenridge is that was actually domestic, right? Ski yeah. trip. Um, um, there's uh, we're working on a scuba trip in Belize for those adventure types. Mm -hmm. um, another hiking trip. A lot of travelers are into hiking, interestingly enough, it's just a thing. Um, so we're looking to do uh, like a Patagonia trip. Um, so those Iceland, you know, Italy, uh, Croatia, Morocco. Yeah. There you go. Pull up, pull up, pull up the itinerary real quick. <laughs> I, I love how even though we're travel nurses and we travel to different cities and do contracts, we still need a vacation from the vacation that we're taking, right? So so in this case, it's all international that mm -hmm. we're doing things. So when you guys fly, what do you require? Obviously, like a passport, like is it like vaccine proof? Like then you, do, you guys book like an agency. How, how does that work? Like the, I'm kind of curious on the back end kind of portion of, of how you guys put this together. Yeah, that's a very good question. So we do a lot of the work ourselves. Um, but for instance, like for Peru, you can't just go grab a boat bag and take a hike, right? There are um, contractors like that are um, specific to Peru. Like they have licenses to operate on that um, in on the Machu Picchu Trail. Um, it's a UNESCO like World Heritage, you know, kind of situation. Is an icon, one of the seven ones of the world. They have to maintain the beauty and um, the aesthetic, and they have to maintain the trail itself. Um, so you have a contractor for that. But in general, it's just a lot of research as Kat would tell you, which is making itineraries. So um, it is important to know, especially in the time of COVID, I guess, like what restrictions there are. For instance, Tanzania and Zanzibar was supposed to be a trip of 2020. Um, you have to get a yellow fever vaccination. That's, mm -hmm. that's just a thing, right? So that's um, part of the research that would be involved in some of the things that you want to convey, you know, to your travelers, to your audience, to your group, um, like what's required. Uh, so different countries will have, have different things. Um, now, depending on the country, well, no, if you're going to Europe or any of it, you need your COVID vaccination. So you need proof of that. Um, other than that, there aren't uh, too many restriction restrictions, um, except maybe if you're going to places like Cuba 
or China. Um, so you just you really need to be mindful of of law, international laws, like where you're going to be and, and the do's and don'ts like of that place. And and part of that is also what staying out of jail for sure and out of trouble, but also being respectful of culture. Right. You can go to a place that do things differently and feel whatever type of way that you feel about it. But guess what? It's not your home. It's theirs. Right. So don't go or respect the culture and at least adhere you know, to, to the rules that they have, but it's important to know what they are. Yeah. With international travel, what is one thing that you've realized that was a culture shock to you with bouncing into the different cultures and immersing yourself to the nationality of, of that tribe? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, do you have something, Kat? I don't, I don't have something um, that was so it, it, it's not like super set in stone, but in Italy, I was there for about five weeks, a couple of years back. And it's, um, if people offer you things, you say yes. Like it, mm -hmm. like we think it's very American. Like, let me get you, let me buy your coffee. Let me get you a snack, like whatever. And you're like, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. And like, to the point of like, you go into this like refusal war, like refuse and sit, refuse and sit. And in Italy, like I just learned, like it's almost, it's like beyond rude. It's just like, just say yes off the bat it genuinely is very respectful and polite and it makes them happy. So if they offer you to come over for dinner, if they're offering you another glass of wine, another serving of food, whatever it is, like, just like say yes. It's like the more polite thing to do. And I think it's so funny because American culture is so independent and my gut reaction is just to always be like, no, 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 it's fine. Like, you know, so. Yeah. That's yeah. I, I had one, uh, Morocco. I love Morocco. Love, love, love Morocco. But it, it was a bit of a call. It was, Morocco can be very aggressive. Um, and that was interesting. You know, so Thailand, haggling is a thing, right? Some people are into it. Some people are annoyed by it. But never take the first price they give you for anything. That's just a little point to your audience, right? But in Morocco, they're so, they can be a, a bit aggressive um, about getting you to buy things or getting you to do things. And it, it could be, I mean, for me, okay, I'm a New Yorker, but I, I recognize like the tension with some of the travelers that we are with and, and them being a bit uncomfortable with how aggressive it could get. Interesting. Yeah. And, I, and I mentioned that because I was taking care of a patient from Croatia and I asked her what she thinks about like the American culture and she used the word fake. And because she, and, right. And I'm like, so why do you think that we're fake? Because we say, thank you or hope you have a great day. But it, she said that it goes to thin air. You just speak to air. You don't speak to the actual person. It's like robotic. It's because it's just nice to say, have a good day or how are you? You don't actually mean it to that person. So that, that made me really think about things and understanding how, for example, like the way Europeans are, or Greece or uh, being in Croatia and having, going to a coffee shop, everybody's so f present. Nobody has to be somewhere. We're not, we don't have that high paced, uh, society feel like we do like in New York, maybe I've never been there or just in the U S in general. Mm. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. I would have loved to have a conversation with that. She, she was on BiPAP, so I you could have talked so much, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of think part of that is, and, and let me just preface that with, um, you know, I'm, we're very fortunate for, for the liberties that we have here. Um, and I'm aware of that. I'm, I'm also aware of where I am and I guess some of the downsides to what it means to be from a place like here. Ultimately, we can, if you're smart enough, crafty enough, or just have people to help you, you can make as much money as you want in the United States. It's not the same for other places. You can literally have nothing, have a great idea and have it all. But I think what I understand about where we are is that we value money above all else. And that permeates everything our culture our interactions like that's just that just becomes what we're about and when you see you know when you talk about like places like italy i've been i haven't had that experience but that sounds like a beautiful experience like you don't turn things down you know like my mother she's also a nurse mm -hmm. uh, and uh she had a lot of like russian patients and and um you know she did like some home care at some point in her life and she said, when you go into their home, they will not let you leave without giving you something. And even if they don't have, like, they forgot you were coming, they'll find, so it'll take something to wrap it up. It's like, here, you can't say no. You know, and and, and we don't have, our cultures is, is just very different. Um, we're not as, like, human-centric, community-centric, family-centric. 
it's unfortunately, it's all about the, the bottom line. However, if you're interested in making money, you can make a lot of money. And even even being a nurse, like firsthand, you go into healthcare, like, okay, I'm your nurse, I'm gonna help out so many people and you get into it and you start, you know, getting comfortable working and you're like one year, two years into your career and you're like, wow, nursing is definitely a business. Like, yeah, you know, patient satisfaction you gotta go up, think about the patient. They always told you nursing school, patient's always right, patient is the most important thing in, in, in the hospital. But if you think about it and you actually like dissect it and dissect healthcare, it's really the, the money. It's crazy to think about, like, when I first went to nursing, I was like so happy, like, yeah, I'm gonna help so much people. And then right now I'm just like, wow, it's literally all about money. Like people are, get, are getting sick and it's just, uh, it's just some kind of a business. Yeah, and I think that's taken a huge toll on nurses. I, I think there was a, a podcast I was listening to it that even before the pandemic, I think, and they called it, I think it's like empathy burnout because you go into nursing with all these ideals of like what you want to do for helping people and how you plan to go above and beyond. Um, and you don't really realize that you need resources to follow through on that. So then you get into nursing and you realize the resources and the structure aren't there to go above and beyond and do the things for the ideals that you were taught and that you wanted to do. And so every day you just leave a little bit disappointed because you just feel like you weren't able to fulfill your, your, your job that day the way you wanted to. And I think that, I mean, even personally takes this toll on me more than, uh, you know, a lot of things in nursing, like, you know, people are always ask like, oh, do the deaths affect you? And like, of course, like, I mean, I'm human, but it's really just not being able to do the, like the best possible care for my patients when I know it's possible with the right resources is what gets me. And I think that's, especially in the pandemic when like all supplies were low, all staffing was low, like you're just, you just know every day you're gonna go in and give substandard care through no fault of your own. And that's like an awful feeling. Yes, especially because in nursing, we learn to give holistic health and we should worry about the mind, body and soul, but the, we don't have time sometimes to be with that patient mm -hmm. and understand them how they're feeling on a spiritual level or help them cope emotionally. It's just more like a mechanic, mechanic shop, like the body's there, we're trouble, at least in the ICU it feels like this mm -hmm. because the patient's super sick, we're doing as much as we can, stabling them hemodynamically and that's it we're losing that other aspect we don't have time to sit bedside and talk to them about mm. things because of ratios or lack of resources mm. yeah and everything's like so protocol based it's almost like you're not looking at a human anymore you're just looking at some kind of a problem they they you have to fix or, or solve you know which is not a bad thing you know we should be looking at patients as like an overall problem because you got to get them get them better but we lose that holistic approach where it's like you're not just treating the body you know, you also have to treat the mind because it all, all, all plays together. You know, you could you could try to, you know, load somebody up with medication, but if they're, you know, not understanding why they're taking this medication, why they're feeling this way, that they're do what they're doing outside of the hospital is is negatively impacting them, the way they're thinking about things, the stress going on, like that, that all plays a role and they have to know that. It's not just like, here, come to the hospital, we're gonna fix you up, put you on a pill and then send you out your way and hopefully, you know, you, could, you, 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 you stay healthy. Like we're, losing like 50 percent of the of the of like the reasoning of why i went into nursing that's just to talk to patients and deal with their with them one-on-one -on -one. and ratio is definitely plays a role and it's probably like the like the major issue in nursing it's been going on forever yeah. and it's crazy to think about and you and like and you, you, said, you said something interesting there about like um I don't know how you said it but treating the body as obviously part of the job but treating the mind being there for the person is just as much a part of nursing as having strong clinical skills and critical thinking skills and, and, and knowing your job. You know, how many patients have you seen in the hospital have no one visit them, right? And they watch TV. I haven't seen patients TV off. Hey, you want me to turn that on? No. And they're just looking at four walls all day, right? No one to talk to. Um, I can remember the most outrageous question I asked the patient. And and I don't know like where, I mean, I, it came from my personality, but uh, I had a patient, um, matter of fact, it was the family member. The father just had a stroke recently, the husband, and, you know, early fifties, two young daughters, like teenage, you know, teenage daughters, and then the wife and, and the family was there. And I remember like one of the kids was there and she stormed out and, and you know, dad is in the hospital bed. And I'm having a conversation with his wife and I just asked her, like, how are the kids handling this? Like, how are the kids doing? Like, it's, like I said, very much a part of my personality, but I recognize the situation holistically, right? 
And and she just we just had this conversation. She's like, yeah, well, you know, the youngest isn't really handling it well. She's starting to lash out, and and we're just talking. And I, I, I without consciously thinking about it, recognizing that you know the patient, the family, the kids, it's a holistic situation. It's not just what's happening, you know, with his meds and his vitals. It's this is a human and a human experience, and we have so much responsibility. I mean, I don't think nurses are aware of the energy they carry when they walk into a room. Patients feel it, you know? They feel if you're annoyed. They feel if you're happy. They feel if you're upset about the day you're having. They feel if you're upset with them or whatever that's happening with them. They feel it. So I like what you said, you know, you're treating the body, but it's also important to, to look at the human holistic. Yeah, and it's so powerful. In that. Yeah, and it's, it's so powerful because, like, where do we, we deal people? We deal with people when they are in their most vulnerable position of their lives. They're in a hospital, especially like you're working step down, you're working ER. People don't know if they're gonna live to see the next day. They're, they're not sure how much time they have, they have left in, in their life. It could be a week, it could be more, depending on what they're in a the hospital for. But you know, you're, you're with them. And like, imagine them not being able to talk to anybody while they're going through probably the most craziest time of, of, their, of their life and the most unpredictable and the most vulnerable. And imagine not having anybody there to talk to. So as nurses, we're not there just to make them better physically, but also like mentally, because like the patient you had that just had stared at the four walls all day. Imagine how much thoughts are going through his head in an eight hour period and with, without anything else, just his mind. Imagine how much thoughts go through your head in just five minutes. Imagine how much thoughts you had just during this interview, during this podcast, so many. And this guy's having them for eight hours straight. Imagine how much release he, he needs. He has to get that out, out of him. Otherwise, it's going to it's gonna like burden his heart and his like soul, you could say, because there's no way to get those thoughts or ideas out. There's nobody to talk to. Yeah. And it goes such a long way if you just sit down and talk to somebody. Like you've had a crazy patient experience like a couple of days ago with the guy with the stroke. Like That's wild. Oh, the one that uh, had the brain? The midline shift? Yeah. 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 He basically told me his definition of God and it was just, it was just beautiful. I had a patient who was intubated, so I had time to pull up a chair, chat with this guy, do my assessment, and just f find out about his life, mm -hmm. where he came from. And it's um, it's beautiful. And I love how you mentioned that the patient feels your energy because that makes all the difference, right? Uh, you could have a family member that's been a pain in the ass to another nurse during the days because we work nights. And you come into the room, everything changes. They trust you. They feel comfortable. And they feel comfortable going home because they know that their family member is in the right hands. And, and I think that's why doing international travel to kind of wrap this in is such a beautiful thing because you get to experience so many different cultures and learn about yourself ultimately. Mm -hmm. And that's what creates you to become a better human being. And that experience is something that you can never get back. And you could apply that to any aspect in life, nursing, entrepreneurship, whatever it is that's you know it's experience that's mm -hmm. where that's where we're here to that's why we're here on this earth to go experience so international travel i think is a great aspect of that 100 mm percent -hmm. yeah it's it's a it's a privilege let's mm -hmm. not get it twisted it is a privilege that we get to do it but i think because we get to do it or because we have access to it i actually think it's important not just for just having a good time but kind of like what you were saying the more varied perspectives you can access, the better it makes you as a human, right? Like you get more understanding. You don't, you don't need limited by, you know, the lens of your own experience as far as you can see. But then when you start, you know, seeing how other people think, seeing how other people live and, and really sitting with that, evaluating that um, respect to where you're from, it, it, it broadens your own personal horizons. Um, I am an advocate for travel, not just to have a good time, but just for the human experience. Yeah, because you understand. Yeah, sorry, just because because you understand that there's people in this world that are living right now as as we speak, but they're doing life completely differently, and and like that, that's okay. Like it, like you said, it broadens your perspective, and you become better as like a nurse and a human being, just because you know there's other ways of doing things, and that's okay. Yeah, what's your take on that chat? Like uh, a cat, like the value of of travel. Oh yeah, I was I was just gonna say, especially in a in a profession where like uh, you know half of the job is science and the other half is is uh, the science of people, right? Like it's it's in understanding people. I think uh, you know nurses have some of the best people reading capabilities. Like don't ever go partying with nurses unless you want them to make you tell all your deepest darkest feelings because we're really good at that. And we're like I sense your energy is off. And like oh no, here we go. Um, so, and I think nurses are really good at that. And I think it's just kind of like almost 
a case study in humanity. The more you see and the more you have experience with, the more you know what to like know about them and their culture and what to expect. Understanding that in certain cultures, what you have to ask of them as a nurse is a little more uncomfortable than with someone else. Um, and I think it just broadens your mindset. I mean, my brother and I both try to travel a lot, him way more <laughs> than myself. And um, it's funny, we say that just talking to people, um, usually someone in the first five or 10 minutes, you can tell if they've traveled internationally or not. They just have a broader mindset in general. They have a little bit uh, grander knowledge of, of people and understandings of more uh, fluid speech on just like casual conversation. It's just, it's a, it's a vibe that's easy to pick up on. And I think that truly really just speaks to, um, you know, you, you meet so many more opportunities um, in the people of those cultures that um, give you such experience that, um, you know, it's, it's good for mental health and, and making you a more rounded person and a, you know, a better person, but also for bringing back to the bedside with you um, and applying to your profession. Yeah, Great so. point. So do you become more relatable? Like, can you, because of traveling internationally, do you think you could put yourself in other people's shoes more often and melt into that person and kind of feel them out? Is that what that we're kind of getting at? Yeah, I mean, like, I don't, <laughs> I don't ever want to call out my, my coworkers or anything, but there's been times where it's just like, I've worked in many diverse ERs as well. And, you know, we have a patient who's, you know, you know, say they're, they're Muslim they're, and they're having a very difficult time because in the ER, the first thing we ask you to do is to get naked and put on a gown, right? Like, cause I got to put a whole bunch of stickers on you <laughs> and do a whole lot of things that are hard when you're fully clothed and nurses who maybe aren't as experienced with that culture get so quickly frustrated with them. Like, come on, you're at a hospital. Like, how, like you're making this so difficult. And when it's like, I still need the same outcome. Like I'm still asking for the same thing from them, but to come in with a different mindset of like, I know this is uncomfortable. Like it'll just be me and you, we're both female. I can ask if maybe we can get a provider to sign up for you. Who's a female. I can take you to the bathroom and do it. So it's not just a curtain. Like, you know what to offer because you know what they value and you know what's important to them. And so when you bring that in again, it circles back to energy. They feel that energy from you that you're not frustrated about it and you're not annoyed with them for what they think is a normal thing to ask. But when you start off on the wrong foot like that, cause you're annoyed cause you don't know better and you don't know more about that person. Then like you said, you know, you, that whole shift sometimes is a complete wash because of that. Yeah, I love that. And it's, a, it's like, uh, just like you mentioned, John, it's putting on that lens. It's the belief systems that we carry with and we're able to kind of dissolve our current belief system and kind of mold it to the greater perspective of what's already out there in the world. We just have to learn how to put on the right glasses. And that's what this allows us to do. Where can people find you or find, find you guys on social media? Yeah. Um, so you can find us at med travel hub on Instagram, please like, and follow us. Um, you can also check out our website, uh, medtravelhub.com. Um, there's trips on there now that we have currently, um, which include our, our trip to Machu Picchu in Ireland. Unfortunately, those are sold out, but you can you can go to our website and kind of get a feel of the brand and get a feel of what we what we're doing. And uh, there's going to be an update to that website with a bunch of other trips that if you're interested in, you can just sign up for more information. We'll send you more information about when we launch or when those ships are actually happening. So that'd be check out medtravelhub.com. I'm also on Facebook as as a human, right? Jonathan Pierre. Um, so check me out on Facebook. Uh, and Kat, you have your own personal. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't use Facebook that much, but Instagram, I'm Ginger Rogers because, you know, why not? Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, keep an eye on the website. We're releasing our 2022 calendar by the end of the year. We're going to have a, a bucket list series, a wellness series, some adventure activities. Um, really looking forward to it. I think everybody's antsy to get back out there. I know we are. And, um, you know, let's let's get our minds right and have some fun. Yep. Awesome. 2022 is going to be a great year. Thank yep. you guys for coming on the show and sharing all your knowledge and experiences of international travel. And hopefully maybe Peter and I could even get on a trip with you guys. We would love that. And thank you again so much for having us. You know, I love the, uh, the entire vibe and mission of, of your podcast. I think it's, it covers topics we all want to talk about and that's what's so great about it and what makes it so diverse. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Kat. Yeah. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.